Hello students, I am Miss Murni. For today's video, we will be going through a quick revision on the GCE O Levels Mathematics subject. Here are the list of topics that will be tested for your O Levels, and the ones that are highlighted in yellow are the ones that we will be discussing today, which are functions and graphs, properties of circle, Pythagoras theorem, and trigonometry. So let's take a look at the functions and graphs. Here are the types of graphs ranging from x to the power of 1 to x to the power of 3. If you notice that the number in front of x denoted by a when it's more than 0 or positive number it will generally go up for this graph and this graph or in the positive region. Whereas when a is negative it will generally go down for these two graphs or it will be in the negative region. So most of you all will have known that for quadratic graphs, which is x square, when a is positive, it will look like a smiley face. When a is negative, it will look like a sad face. So previously, we have looked at the powers, which are positive numbers. What if the powers are negative numbers? So same thing here, if a is positive, it will be generally increasing or it will be in a positive region vice versa for when a is a negative. So for the power when it's a negative number, we can also represent it in a fraction. This is using your knowledge of indices by reciprocaling the ax to the power negative 1 to become a over x. Same thing here, ax to the power negative 2 to become a over x squared. Another type of graph is when the power is your x variable which is one of your x-axis. So it will generally look something like this, either going up when a is positive or going down when a is negative. Before we go through what are the quadratic graphs, we have to look at the basic concepts of linear graph. So the general equation of this linear graph is y equals to mx plus c. So y is the y-axis, m is usually the gradient, x is the x-axis, and c is a constant. Here we have a very simple plot of the y and x axis and the intersection here is actually zero or you can also call it the point of origin. So for linear graph there are three things that you have to look out for. First is your y intercept. When finding your y intercept you have to substitute x equals to zero into the equation. Hence your coordinates would then be for x will be zero and your y-intercept will be the one that you have found. Next is your x-intercept, where you have to substitute y equals to 0 into the equations, which means you have to solve for x. Hence, the coordinates will then be the, na the number you found for the x-coordinate, and y-coordinate will then be 0. Lastly is your gradient. Most of you will have known how to find your gradient by the formula rise over run. Or you can also remember it as the difference of y over difference of x. So one such example here is a simple plot of y equals to x. By referencing this equation to the general equation, we can actually conclude that the gradient is 1, which is the 1 in front here, and the constant is 0. So when you find the y-intercept and the x-intercept, both are actually 0 or at the point of origin. As for your gradient, you can choose any two points of the line here and actually to get your gradient which is rise over run, which would be 1. I would like to emphasize the significance of constant in your y equals to mx plus c. This will actually tell us if the line will go up or down the y-axis from the point of origin which is 0. So one example here is when the constant is positive 2. So we have this plot here and if you notice it actually went up from the point of origin. Hence when we find our y and x intercept, the y intercept will be 2, the x intercept will be negative 2. When the constant is a negative, example here is the negative 2 here, the line or the graph here will actually go down the y-axis. Hence, when we find our y-intercept and our x-intercept, 
will be negative 2 and positive 2 respectively. Now let's look at quadratic graphs. The general equation of the quadratic graph is y equals to ax squared plus bx plus c. The letters here a, b and c are actually numbers. It can be positive or negative. So here we have a simple plot of a quadratic graph with the equation y equals to x squared minus ax plus 12. So, so for quadratic graphs, we have five things that you have to look out for. First is your y-intercept. Same thing, you have to substitute x equals to 0 into the equation to find your y-intercept. Hence, your y-intercept here will be 12. Next is to find your x-intercept, which means you have to substitute y equals to 0. If you remember in your previous chapters where you have to uh, quadratic equations, you must factorize it or you can use your calculator to directly find your two answers or you can use a quadratic formula. So here I have actually factorized them into x minus 2 and x minus 6. Hence, when you solve for x, it will then be positive 2 and positive 6, which are your x-intercepts. Next is to find your gradient. So to find your gradient, you have to actually use your tangent. So for example, the question asks you to find the gradient at this point x equals to 3, which I have already um, highlighted here in yellow. You must then draw the tangent as close as possible to the line x equals to 3. Afterwards, you can then find any two points on the line here, example here and here, and use your formula rise over run. Next is to find your line of symmetry. To find your line of symmetry, we can actually find it directly from your x-intercepts. Hence, you can just 2 plus 6 to find your line of symmetry, which is 4. Lastly, is to find your maximum or minimum point. In this case, we are finding our minimum point here for a set, uh, set face or a negative x square. It will then be a maximum point. Since this actually the line of symmetry and the minimum point is correlated to each other, we can actually substitute x equals to 4 into the equation to find our y coordinate, which in this case is negative 4. Completing the square method is another method to actually find your two answers or your two x-intercepts. So to do this, you have to add or subtract this formula b over 2 square to the quadratic equation here. Take note your b is referring to the number, so please do not include the x as well. So when you're including the b, make sure that you identify it as positive or negative number according to the quadratic equation given to you. An example here it will be y equals to x square minus 4x plus 1. So how do we add this formula b over 2 square to the equation here? So first, you have to add it to the x variables here, which is this group. Afterwards, you have to minus it from the constant, which is this one. So we have a plus here and a, neg and a minus here. So after you have simplified everything, you should be able to get this equation here. And lastly, you have to factorize the one which is inside the bracket, which you should get x minus 2 square minus 3. Take note that when you do complete the square method, you have to get this general equation which is x minus a bracket square plus b. If not, it means that you have done the equation wrongly or your method was wrong. So how can we use this complete the square method equation into sketching our graphs? So here I have a simple plot of the previous equation that we used, y equals to x square minus 4x plus 1. The same thing as before, we are looking out for five things. So first one will be your y-intercept, which you can easily do it by substituting x equals to 0 into the equation. Next is to find your y, your x-intercept. So to do this, we can actually use our complete the square method equation. So first, we actually have to equal it to 0. We can then bring it forward to become positive 3. To carry off the square, we must square root both sides. Don't forget your plus minus as well. Hence, your x-intercept will then be square root 3 plus 2 or negative square root 3 plus 2. 
which you then will be able to get in your calculator 0 0.268 and 3.73 by 3SF. Next is to use your to find your gradient where it depends on your question asking which point they are looking for. Next is your line of symmetry. I'll go through further with you on how to find your line of symmetry in this next point which is to find your maximum or minimum point. In this case, it's to find your minimum point. So how do you find your minimum point from the complete the square method equation? So here, we can actually directly find our y coordinate from the constant here, which is your b. So in this case, it's negative 3. For your x coordinate, we have to solve inside the bracket. So that will be x minus a in this case. So you should be able to get positive 2. Hence, your minimum point coordinates would be 2 comma negative 3. Since the minimum point is related to the line of symmetry, hence your line of symmetry would be x equals to 2. There are also some questions where you, you have to sketch and there will be no x-intercept. So how can we determine if there are any x-intercepts from the complete the square method equation? The same thing we have to look out for are the five things. The first one being your y-intercept. So you should be able to get 4 here. Next is to find your x-intercept. So using your complete the square method equation, you would be able to get x minus 1 equals to plus minus square root negative 3. However, if you try, if you try to uh, type in square root negative 3 into your calculator, you will get an error. Hence, we can then conclude there is actually no x-intercept. Next is your gradient. The fourth one will be your line of symmetry. Again, I will explain to you how is this related to your maximum or minimum point. So to find your maximum or minimum point, again, you use your complete the square method equation here. So to find your coordinates for y is positive 3, which is the constant here. And to find your x-coordinate, is to actually solve the x minus 1 which is inside this bracket here. Hence, you should be able to get your minimum point in this case, positive 1 bracket, positive 3. And since this is actually related to your line of symmetry, we can then conclude that the line of symmetry is x equals to positive 1. Here are some tips that you can do while tackling the questions for functions and graphs. So while sketching a graph, First thing is you have to determine what is needed. For example, x-intercepts, y-intercept, line of symmetry, or maximum minimum point. Second is to check if there is any x-intercept by using the calculator. So we can actually use the function in your calculator to find the two x-intercepts. So if the first one shows a whole number, we can then proceed normally. If it shows a irrational numbers, you have to check further using complete the square method. Next is to plot your graph. So to actually improve on this part, you have to actually try many questions to actually practice on how to draw your graph and be exposed to different types of questions. But for now, I will just touch on simple tips that you can do first before you tackle all the different questions. So first one is to duplicate the table of X and Y values, which is the one in the top left hand corner here. Next is to take note of the range of numbers for x and y axis respectively. So for example, the x axis is from 1.5 to 8. However, take note on how many units you are using. For example, I have used 1 cm, which is one small box here, for one unit. So make sure that this unit is actually constant throughout for either y axis or the x axis or both. Next is to plot the points using the mark X, according to the ones they have calculated here in your table. Lastly is to connect the points using your French curve or you can use freehand as long as it looks like a smooth curve. Afterwards, you must then label the curve with the equation that the question have provided for you, which is the one here. Now, we will be looking at properties of circles. So before we look at the different angle properties, we have to understand the different lines of the circle. So the first one will be your chord, which is denoted by the green color here. 
So your chord don't have to pass through the center here, which is your O. So you can touch for any point from one circumference to the other side of the circumference. Next is your diameter. I think you all should know by now that di your diameter is the one that cuts across directly in the center of the circle to produce two equal semicircles. Your radius is half the length of your diameter. Hence, it should be any point of the, semis of the circumference as long as it touches the center here. Next is your tangent. Your tangent can touch any point on the circumference of the circle. Next is to actually name these uh, semicircles into ma minor and major segments. So this orange line here is called your chord. So we have the bigger semicircle here called the major segment and the smaller semicircle here called the mi minor segment. So we have the minor arc and the major arc. So this is another type of example for minor and major sector. So let's take a look at the angle properties. So for the first one, we have angle at center equivalent to two angles at circumference. So this actually looks like a wing shape. So take note that the angle which is at the center denoted by A is two times the angle of the angle at the circumference denoted by B. Next is angle in the same segment. So this angle in the same segment actually looks the same as a wing. So this angle here, A, is the same as this angle here, B. Next is your angle in a semicircle. For this angle property to be applied, you have to have a diameter that cuts across the center and a triangle in the semicircle. Hence, you can conclude that your angle here at the circumference or A is actually 90 degrees. The next one will be your tangent perpendicular to radius. So remember that tangent can be touching on any points of the circumference. So for this to be applied, the radius from the center to the circumference have to touch a tangent in order for the angle between the radius here and the tangent to be 90 degrees. So another type of shape that the angle at center equivalent to two angles at circumference can be an arrow shape here. So it means that the angle which is AOB will be two times the angle at ACB. Another type of this shape can also be a quadrilateral with one of the corners at the center. So it means that the reflex angle of AOB will be two times the angle of APB. The next one will be this quadrilateral in a circle called angles in the opposite segment. It means that this angle A here and the opposite angle B here, the sum of it is equivalent to 180. Take note that these two are not equal length. The same for angle C and angle D here, where the sum is equivalent to 180 degrees. Next is the perpendicular from center which bisects the chord. So for this to occur, it can be any chord from one circumference to the other circumference and the center reaching the midpoint here which is denoted by B. Hence, the angle between OB and BC will be perpendicular which is 90 degrees and the length of AB and BC are equivalent. Next is tangents from external point. So the tangents of TP and QT all extends to meet at this point T. Hence, we can conclude that the length of TP and TQ are actually equivalent. So once these two lengths are equivalent, we can associate it with isosceles triangle. Lastly, is equal chords equidistant from the center. So we have the same chords here, but there are two of them. So once these two radius meet, meet each other at the center O here, we can conclude that AB, the length of AB and CD is equivalent, and OP and OQ are equivalent length as well. Here are some tips that you can take note of when tackling these questions. First of all, you can use these three steps before tackling the questions. The first one being finding the radius or diameter for the radius, as I said before, is to actually identify the isosceles triangle. So this diameter will be important in the next part, which is to find your right angle. So for angle in a semicircle, you have to identify if there are any 
diameter. And for right angles, it is also associated with tangent perpendicular to radius or the uh, perpendicular chords which bisects the center. The last one is to find your parallel lines. So for this, is to actually help you in applying angle rules that you have learned in congruence and similarity. Lastly, is to annotate your known angles using pencil. This is because when you use a correction pen or correction tape, it will be very messy when you uh, have to rewrite back on your diagram. The final topic that I will be discussing is trigonometry and Pythagoras theorem. So for Pythagoras theorem, it's only applied to right-angled triangles. So I have this triangle here with a 90 degree angle here. So the general formula for this will be a square plus b square equals to c square. So this is only to find your sides of a triangle. Let's look at what are acute angles. Acute angles are angles that are less than 90 degrees here. So it's actually denoted by theta here. So before we look at all the different trigonometry functions, we have to label our right angle triangles first. So with respect to the angle theta here, the first one, which is A, is the opposite. The one just beside is your adjacent. And the longest length of the triangle will be hypotenuse. So when we use the abbreviation TOKA, so we'll then be able to find our tan theta, which is opposite over angle cos theta which is adjacent over hypotenuse and sin theta which is opposite over hypotenuse. We also have to consider obtuse angles. What are obtuse angles? They are angles that are more than 90 degrees but less than 180 degrees. So before we delve into using the trigonometric functions for obtuse angles, let's first take a look at this y and axis plots of the right angle triangle. So we can actually denote this as y-axis and x-axis. So before we look at a triangle, I would like to label all these four squares into different quadrants. So this will be the first quadrant. This will be the second quadrant. And this will be the third and the fourth. Third and the fourth. So for this particular syllabus, I will only be looking at the first and the second quadrant. So the first quadrant is where all the numbers for the y-axis and x-axis are positive. Hence, when we, uh, when we look at all these numbers here, they are actually positive. So with respect to theta, we can label them as such. So these are opposite, hypotenuse, and adjacent. Hence, when we use the formula for acute angle, we can then find our sine theta to be 3 over 5, cos theta to be 4 over 5, and 10 theta to be 3 over 4. Next, we can look at the obtuse angle, which is in the second quadrant. So the obtuse angle is actually referring to this 180 degrees minus theta. However, if you notice here that the rest of the numbers remain the same except for the adjacent here. So this is actually in the negative part of the x-axis. Hence, instead of positive 4, it will be negative 4. So the general formula of the obtuse angle would be as seen here. So sine 180 degrees minus theta equivalent to sine theta, cos 180 degrees minus theta equivalent to negative cos theta, then 180 degrees minus theta equivalent to negative tan theta. So one way to remember which one is positive or negative is to actually referring to the first quadrant where all is positive and the second quadrant where only sine is positive. So please take note when you're actually trying to find the obtuse angle. So when we compare this side by side, we can then actually substitute the numbers to find our obtuse angles. So for example, we have the first one which is sine. So we know that it's actually a positive sine theta. We can just use 3 over 5. Next is to find your cosine. So we know that this actually must be negative, hence it will be negative 4 over 5. Lastly is your tangent, which is also negative, hence it will be 3 over 4. So far we have looked at right angle triangle. So what about non-right angle triangle? So usually to find our area of 
a right angle triangle is by using this formula half times base times perpendicular height. So same thing here, we have to actually find our perpendicular height in this non right angle triangle. So before that, we have to label our triangles first. So firstly is the capital letter A and the small letter A. So this capital letter A is referring to the angle. The small letter A is referring to the length. So make sure you have a set of opposite length and angle. Next is your capital letter B and your small letter B. Capital letter C and your small letter C. So we can then actually use them in this formula for non right angle triangle half times AB sine C. So before we do that, we have to actually find our right angle triangle, our right angle, which is can be seen from here. So we can actually draw a line across here to find our right angle. I have a sample question here with all the size and angle labeled with capital letters and small letters. So I have also determined the perpendicular height of this non right angle triangle. So how do we can actually incorporate this into the formula half AB sine C? So we can just easily substitute all the letters with the numbers that we have been given here. Hence, we will then be able to find this, the area of the non right angle triangle. Apart from finding the area, we can also find the sides as well as the angle from the non right angle triangle. So before we look at the formula for the first one, which is sine rule, we have to actually label our sides and our angle according to this capital letter for the angles and small letters for the sides. Afterwards, we can then look at the sine rule, which is denoted by this formula here. I would not recommend you to actually remember the formula as you will be given in the formula sheet during your test. So I have a sample question here where we actually have labeled all the sides and the angles which we have here is AA, BB and your C here, capital letter C and small letter C. So when we use the formula, we can just straight away substitute all the letters with the numbers. Hence, we can then find our angle, which is angle B here, by inversing the sign, which you will then get 61.0 degrees Celsius. Remember to leave it in 1 dp. So when can we use sine rule? So make sure there are at least two sets of angle and length. What I mean is to have what two sets of AA and BB. And at least one of it is unknown, whether angle or length. So in this question here, our angle B is unknown. The second type of rule that you can use is to use the cosine rule. Again, I have labeled all my sides and angles of this non right angle triangle. So the formula of this cosine rule is A square equals to B square plus C square minus 2BC cos A. Take note if it's a capital letter or a small letter and referring to which. Here I have a sample question where the angle A, side C and side B are given. However, we need to find what is the length of side A. So using the formula that we have learned from cosine rule, we can just substitute all the letters with the numbers that we have been given. Hence, you should be able to get the side A to be equivalent to 3.66. Remember to leave it in 3SF. So when do we actually use the cosine rule? You can only use cosine rule if there is an angle in between two lengths. Here are some tips when tackling these trigonometry questions. First of all is to determine the type of triangle. If it's a right angle triangle, you can use the tokaso. If it's a non right angle triangle, you must use the sine or cosine rule. Next is to label the triangles accordingly. For a right angle triangle, you can label them according to hypotenuse, opposite or adjacent, whereas the non right angle triangle is to label the three sets of opposite length and angle, which is capital letter A for the angle and small letter A for the sides. Lastly, is to determine when to use sine or cosine rule. For sine rule, you should have at least two sets of length and angle with unknown angle or length. So it means that you can actually find your AA and your BB. 
with at least either one of it being the unknown. So for example, I can have your angle A here as the unknown. The next one for cosine rule is to have at least one angle in between two length. So I have a triangle here and you can actually use it if you know this length here and this length here and the angle here is known, for example, 48 degrees. So the only thing that you have to find is this length here. Thank you and this will be the end of the video.